Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look, that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him, no looks to attract our eyes, a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet, Ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shears, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich. Though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs. He shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty, for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner, while he was bearing the faults of many, and praying all the time for sinners. The Word of the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice set me free. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem me. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In the face of all my foes I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbours and a fear to my friends. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like a dead man forgotten in men's hearts, like a thing thrown away. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God, my life is in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your love. Be strong, let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest, who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never, ne never let go of the faith that we have professed, for it is not as if we had a high priest who is incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we will have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. 
Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth he offered up prayer and entreaty aloud and in silent tears to the one who had the power to save him out of death and he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learned to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Christ was humble yet, even accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him on high and gave him the name which is above all names. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there and he went into it with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place well since Jesus had often met his disciples there, and he brought the cohort to this place together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing everything that was going to happen to him, Jesus came forward and said, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, I am he. Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus replied, I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfil the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter with the other disciple followed Jesus. This disciple who was known to the high priest went with Jesus into the high priest's palace, but Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Are you another of that man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret. But why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by Jesus gave him a slap on the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offence in it, why do you strike me? Then Annas said to him, sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at once, a cock and they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was now morning. They didn't go into the praetorium immediately or they would have been defiled and unable to eat the Passover. 
So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, If he were not a criminal, we should not be handing him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and try him according to your own law. The Jews answered, We're not allowed to put a man to death. This was to fulfil the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me from being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. Pilate said, So you are the king then? Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth, what is that? With that he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged. After this, the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown, and they put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Look, I'm going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free. But the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes himself a king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated him on the chair of judgment in a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They said, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, or as it is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews, because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the Jewish chief priest said to Pilate, You should not write King of the Jews, but this man said I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. 
the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who will have it. In this way the words of scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed and that to fulfil the scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. preparation day and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him, and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead, and so instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance. And immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth, and he gives it so that you may believe as well. Because all this happened to fulfil the words of Scripture, not one bone of his will be broken. And again in another place, Scripture says, they will look upon him, the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the one who had first come to Jesus at night, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Impossible Exile. That's the name of a biography I've uh, recently read about a man called Stefan Zweig. He was an early 20th century Austrian writer who, to be quite frank with you, is not all that well known, but whose works have in the past few years been experiencing a little bit of a revival. The biography partly dwells on the period that Zweig spent in exile. He'd fled Austria when the Nazis took over, and he spent the next few years of his life wandering around from country to country, very unhappy, never quite feeling at home anywhere. In fact, the basic point of the biography is actually to show, I think, the destructive effect that exile had on one of the most productive and imaginative of writers. Once he left Austria, he found himself completely lost, 
cut off from all that had sustained him. And he could never quite get used to the language and culture of the countries he'd ended up in. In the end, he committed suicide with his girlfriend in Brazil in 1942. That biography is a haunting account of how exile can destroy you. It cuts you off from what sustains you. It isolates and bewilders you. It impoverishes and infantilizes you and renders you helpless and dependent. Now exile is a word which many portions of the scriptures and many Christian theologians have used to describe our human existence. By using that word, they point to a deep truth at the heart of human life. Whilst we live here on earth, there is a sense in which this is our home. We have nowhere else to go after all, and God has made us to be physical beings who live in his creation. Yet at the same time, something deep down in us tells us that this, this physical world isn't all that there is. We have another destiny, which is our real home, the place we will eventually live forever, and in which we will feel perfectly at peace and perfectly reconciled. So how do we make our way out of exile and find that place where we will truly be at home? Well, the liturgy today presents us in a very stark and clear and uncompromising way with the thing we need to ensure that we are released from exile. The thing which gives us the promise of eternal life with God is Jesus. And Jesus alone. Nothing else. The whole narrative of the scriptures through the creation, the Old Testament and the life of Christ, I think, shows us two things. The first is that God constantly wants to draw us back to himself. He never gives up on giving us a second chance of going the extra mile for us, of calling us back afresh to his heart. But the second thing we constantly learn is that despite best intentions, human beings can never quite make it back to God on their own, by their own strength. They need him to take the initiative, to hold out his hand to them first and supply the love needed to overcome the chasm between the God of life and holiness and the realm of fallible human beings. And on the cross, on the cross, I think we see those two things resolved. In Christ's giving of himself, God takes the initiative and gives to us finally what we need to know him perfectly. St. Paul tells us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't leave us in our exile, but reached out to us, taking to himself our sins, our refusals of his grace, our stubbornness of heart, and our lack of faith and trust. The cross becomes, for those who believe in Christ, our way out of exile, our root into promised land. For those who trust in Christ's power to save, it becomes the source of true life and the promise of a true home. So whoever you are, whatever your history, wherever you come from, whatever you've done, however much you think you've accomplished in life, however much you feel you've stuffed it up, no matter how early in life, or how late in years you come to Jesus, his death on the cross overcomes everything that makes you feel like an exile. It gives you the hope of eternal life in the knowledge of your own certain death. It gives you purpose in the face of a life that can at times be confusing and bewildering. It shows you what love looks like in a world where love sometimes seems absent. It gives you strength when you feel exhausted. 
And the irony of that whole mystery is this. The way Jesus offered us a route out of exile was to become an exile himself. He left his heavenly home at his Father's right hand and became a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth for us. He was cut off from all who knew him and isolated by pain so that our isolation could be reconciled. His exile is the thing that brings our exile to an end. His death is what overcomes our death. And his separation from his Father is what guarantees we need never fear separation from God. Let us pray, dear beloved, for the whole Church of God, that our God and Lord may be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your Church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith, in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for Pope Francis and for all who lead the Church, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy Church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect Pope Francis. That under him, the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our own Bishop Jonathan, and for all bishops, priests and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the inner ears and their inmost hearts, and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever faithful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens, the reborn in the font of baptism, they may be adopted to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, and those whom one baptism has consecrated, that they may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Let us also pray for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit they too may enter on the way of salvation. Mighty and ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, 
they may find the truth that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever living God who created all people, to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognise the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you the one true God and Father of our human race. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart, and the rights of peoples, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families and salvation to all the victims who have died. Almighty ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them, Welcome into your peace those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travellers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comforter of mourners, strengthen all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. Come, let us worship. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. Come, let us worship. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. Come, let us worship.
and say this command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Gracious grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour Jesus Christ. For the King and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Almighty ever living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery we may have a life. 